Hey guys, it's Cam here, welcoming you back to the build room. In this week's episode, we are finally getting some paint on the interior of Violet Crumbles. So stick around and check it out. Okay, so we're back. Uh, it's been a spell. I've unfortunately been off sick. It's been about four or five weeks now since I've done any work to Violet Crumbles, which is a real shame. I was hoping to have it far more progressed for Turtles in the Park, which is coming up this weekend, uh, to take that down, but it ain't happening. Instead, what we're gonna try and do today is get that interior painted. Now, that'll be a big milestone because I can finally start putting the interior back in, or at least getting it out of the way in the garage. But in order to do that, there is still some work that needs to be done. Now, I've cut out all of the rust from the interior, or the floor pan at least, and uh, plated that all up, but there is some cracking in some areas uh, and a few other little bits that I wasn't happy with as I was going through with patches that need to be fixed, which means we've got some welding to do, and then we've got to strip all the paint off that and off the underside, because if we use a mechanical abrasive technique to pull the underside paint off, once we've painted the interior, I'm worried that it will create too much heat and will actually ruin the bond between the new paint. But for now, there's some welding to be done and I've been off sick, so what do you do when you're sick and a car guy? You do online shopping for tools, of course. Which means we've got some new things to play with today, so let's have a look. Now in the last episode, one of the things that I did mention quickly was that I broke my welding helmet. Welding helmets have a stop on them, which stops the helmet coming down too far and hitting your face when you flip it down. Uh, this is a pretty old helmet, I'd say 10 to 15 years at least now. So A, it's pretty old technology and things have come a long way since, but also wear and tear had just killed it. So um, I did do a hasty repair and I used the soldering iron to plasti weld some bits and then uh, bolstered that with a couple of nuts and bolts and it still works. I could get away with continuing to use this, but like I said, it's old and it's probably due for replacement anyway. So I've decided to keep this one as a spare and we have got an upgrade and a big upgrade I'm hoping. So this is the Lincoln 3350 series welding helmet. Now, uh, Lincoln Electric, yes, my welder is Lincoln and I've got a few other bits and pieces of Lincoln around here and obviously I have a fair amount of brand loyalty in my personality traits, but I didn't deliberately buy a Lincoln just for the brand name. Uh, I did have a look at a bunch of different helmets and in terms of what was available in Australia and what met my needs, the Lincoln came up trumps. So let's have a look. So Lincoln uh, always put in a bunch of stickers. Uh, I don't probably use those. Um, and this is the helmet itself. There's a few different models, but this is the 3350 in a code red shell. So if we pull the box out of the way, go through some of the features here. Now, the first and the most obvious one is the welding screen size. So if I put these two side by side, and I'm not hating on the World Guard here. It's been a good helmet for the time that I've used it. I honestly don't know much about the quality of those. Um, I bought it when I bought my first welder. I bought a good welder and then I just said, what's a good helmet in the shop? And this is what they handed me that wasn't gonna break the bank. Now, the main difference here, as you can see, is the size of the lens. I'll just pull this sticker off. And you can see all this area here is about double the height of the World Guard one. Now, it's not particularly it's not a particular requirement that you have to have a big screen. All this means is when the, uh, when the mask is sitting away from your face, you do get a little bit of a mailbox effect when you're working with something like this and it can be very difficult to see what's around you and get context of where you're trying to weld. Uh, particularly when you are in cramped quarters or you're upside down under the car and considering the welding that I've got to do uh, inside the car and then under the car, uh, I wanted something that was a lot bigger. The other thing that the Lincoln has is a grind button. So what that grind button does, if you are welding away and you need to pick up the grinder, you can just hold down that button, I think it's for three seconds or something, and it'll switch into grind mode, which means when you start grinding, the lens will not tint to the point where it does with welding. So you'll still be able to see, you don't have to take the helmet off. At the moment, I have to alternate between this helmet and my grinding shield here, uh, which is not only a pain in the ass, but it also means you're continually putting one of these on the ground and you can see how scratched up and ruined they are. Um, you know, scratching the, the housing itself isn't a big deal, but when you start scratching the plastic covers on the lens, it makes it hard to see out of them, all that sort of thing. Now, 
The other thing I liked about this one is it's incredibly adjustable from shade five to shade 13. So I can do uh, really low amperish TIG welding when I eventually get a TIG welder. Uh, and also apparently these have a really, really clear lens, the, a really high level optical clarity. So um, I struggle a little bit, especially working in this garage with the lighting that I have in terms of being able to see what I'm welding with the helmet on. Uh, so I'm hoping I'll get a big improvement here, which basically just makes everything a little bit more comfortable. Uh, the other thing I like is this is kind of like Iron Man red, which is awesome. Uh, lots of welding helmets are pretty kitsch in terms of what they put on them for some reason, or just plain blacks and things like that. I wanted something that looked a little bit cool if I was gonna spend 400 bucks. So there it is. We've got speed stripes and Iron Man red. How can you go wrong? In addition to the helmet, we've got a bunch of other things, including a big welding blanket so I can cover the car up when I'm welding and stop ruining parts on it. We've got some gauntlets. Uh, I know I've got a nice welding jacket, but summer is coming and that welding jacket is pretty hot to have on. So at least I can just slip on the gauntlets with a t-shirt on if I want to use that. I did get a head cover, uh, especially for when I'm welding under the car because I know uh, I'm going to be getting sparks and stuff straight on my head. And then I got some more gloves. I got more of the Unimig ones that I use most of the time, the Rogues. These are a TIG glove. They're really, really good for that tactile feel. The issue that I have with them is the backs are foam uh, or some spandex kind of a thing, uh, which means you have a lot of uh, dexterity, but you don't have a lot of protection here. And I have, usually when I'm using the grinder and things like that, end up grinding through the back portion of them. So great gloves, but just use them for the welding bit. Don't use them for grinding and stuff like that. I did also get a set of Lincoln uh, leather gloves. Now these are leather on the back as well, obviously. So you've got a bit more protection there and I'll use them when I'm welding in places where I'm likely to end up burning through or I'm working so close to the work that the heat comes through on the back of the hand and starts to get a bit warm for comfort. So yeah, hopefully we're pretty much good to go on the welding front now. I am really excited to give this thing a whirl. Uh, I'll give some feedback probably at the end of the episode as to how it does in comparison to the older one. For now, let's take a look at the car and see what we've got to do. All right, so this is how the interior looks at the moment. All of the rust has been cut out. Uh, the center bracing section that normally runs along here is still out because I wanna clean all the paint off that back area first before I weld that back in. And there's a couple of little things I still wanna finish up. So previously, holes like this one here and that one over there, they were filled with a metal tape and then they had sound deadener over the top, which probably kept the moisture out when all of that was in place, but I'm not gonna be happy with that moving forward. So I'm gonna fill those. The second thing is the handbrake here. As you can see, we've got cracking around the bolt holes, which is no good. Uh, that's from the handbrake being pulled several times, very hard, I would say. Makes me think that perhaps this was used as a amateur rally car more than I originally thought because uh, yeah, that's pretty bad cracking. So what we're gonna do with those is just take the die grinder in and open up these cracks here a little bit further and then we'll weld them in uh, and then move on. I don't wanna put a plate over the top of this because I'm not really sure how the boots and everything fit in here. And if I weld a plate in here and it makes it a lot thicker than it used to be, I may have trouble getting some of the uh, grommets and things back into here. What I may do is actually reinforce the mounting arm so it uses all four bolts in a more stable fashion moving forward. But for now, weld the cracks up and move on. And then the other thing that makes me think rally car is you can see here on the driver's side rear mount, there's cracking. So this is already, I'm gonna try and get a good shot of this. So you can see here it's cracked and is already starting to fail and bend down. Now, obviously that's only gonna continue, especially with someone my weight in here. So what I'm gonna do again, grind out that area, pull it back into shape and then weld it up. But I don't expect that to hold moving forward. It's obviously something that's weak enough to break from the factory, so simply just welding it back up again is not gonna do the job, even if I wasn't rallying this or anything. So what I'm gonna do is build out a metal plate that goes from here down to the floor to brace a little bit more. Now these are scalloped out like this, I believe just to give more foot room for the people in the back. And let's face it, we don't care about the foot room of people in the back. So yeah, I'm gonna make a plate from basically this corner down to this section here. I'm not gonna move it out far enough to be on the flat because I think that's a bit excessive. It should be enough just to have some metal in there. I will use much thicker gauge sheet metal than I would normally use. So not the 0.9 mil, it'll be more like 1.2 I think we'll get into here. 
Oh, and for those of you who've been watching the last episodes, I did end up taking this bung area that used to be in the floor pan here out. There's a few reasons for that. Firstly, we had to take it out on this side because of the rust. So I wanted this side to match when you look at the underbody of the car. The second thing is when I go to sheet this with Dynamat or whatever I do use in the end, it'll be a lot easier to do without that in there. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with the way this one came out. Nice clean sheet metal in, really happy with the world. So job's a good and we can move on. All right, so let's get those couple of things buttoned up and uh, then it's on to the arduous task of stripping all of this paint. Woohoo. Okay, so all of the plating and repairs are done. It went pretty well. Uh, now I'm going to strip the paint along the back of the floor pan there and along the front here where the brace goes. That'll allow me to get access now and then I can weld the brace in finally and the brace goes from here to here. And then once that's done, we'll come back, have a look at everything in a bit more detail and then we'll check out the paint system that we're gonna use.
All right, so all the paint's been stripped out and the bracing has been welded back in. Now, before we move on from this, I just wanted to show you one little thing, which was, uh, if we have a look at this spot weld here, this is the first one that I did. And unfortunately I had the welder turned up way too high. I'd walked past it and brushed it and obviously knocked it up about 50% more than it should have been. Uh, so put an incredible amount of heat in here. But I wanted to show you the state of the copper primer around it. Now this is the whole point of copper primer in that not only is it conductive, but it also doesn't peel away from the surface when it gets affected by heat, which means that metal is still technically protected there. So if I was to scratch that off, you can actually see underneath the discoloration, there's still copper there. So it's not like all the copper's burnt off this area, there is still stuff there. And I just wanted to show you that because if you have this on the backing plate of a piece of metal and then you weld something up, the copper is still gonna provide protection on either side of the weld anyway. That's why I use it on the back of panels. You'll see people online saying that, oh, copper doesn't adhere to metal, yada, yada, yada. I'm not sure the validity of those comments, whether those people have had a bad experience with a certain copper primer or whether they're talking about copper itself not adhering directly to metal. And the bottom line is while this paint has copper in it, it's not pure copper that you're spraying. Obviously there's adhesive promoters and other sort of protectants and stuff that go into the paint that enable it to stick like that and manage the heat well. If this had a galvanizing weld through primer on it, I think a lot more of it would have burnt off because the temperature at which those galvanized products turn into a gas, uh, you go from a solid and evaporate, uh, is a lot lower than copper. So yeah, that's why I go with copper primer and that's why I think it works. Anyway, as you can see, it all went back in place. It's nice and strong. Some of those welds aren't the neatest, but the bottom line is you're never gonna see them. They're gonna be under insulation and carpet or the back seat. So I'm not really bothered. And as I've said in previous videos, I don't intend on trying to get this to a point where any of those welds and repairs are hidden. The bottom line is, I think there's an honesty to the way it's been repaired at the moment. And at the end of the day, it's in the interior of the car. So it's never going to be seen unless someone is pulling this apart for any specific reason in the future. So yeah, what we have to do now is strip the remainder of the paint off the other two thirds of the floor pan and also get underneath the car. And anywhere that I've welded through a plate, I need to grind down and make sure it's flat and there's no weld penetration on the other side. And also if I feel like I'm going to get too much heat by stripping off the paint underneath, I'll also have to go and strip all that paint too. Because like I said, I don't want to ruin the bond with the new paint that's coating the interior. So yeah, that's going to be a pretty boring process to watch. I think I've subjected you to enough of that as it is. So I'm just going to go, oh, hang on. Damn it, I think I'm going to need something with a bit more power. Okay, so we're gonna let Iron Man do his thing over there and we are gonna talk about paint. Now, this is the KVS coating system for rust seal. It's a three-step process. Uh, the idea is there is a degreaser, which is the AquaClean, a rust converter, rust blast, and then a top coat. There's no primer for the top coat. The idea behind this is that it actually bonds directly to porous metal. So uh, ideally a sandblasted surface or something that's been mechanically abraded like uh, the wire brushes that I've used or a sandpaper or something like that. It's a moisture cured product. 
uh, which means basically the humidity in the air is what's going to cure that paint. It's not a two part, it's a single pack. And it sets extremely hard. This actually has a military specification or grading. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. If I do, I'll throw it down here. Um, but basically this is rated to be used on the interior decking of Navy ships. So anything that's good enough to be walked over continually in a saltwater environment should be good enough for Violet Crumbles. You'll notice I said interior, it's not UV stable. It has a small amount of UV stability, more than the competing Pore 15 product from what I've read, uh, which is why I actually picked KBS, in addition to the fact that Pore 15 is extremely difficult to find where I am. Uh, I'm not sure about other areas in Australia, but certainly in Perth, I couldn't find anyone that stopped it. Everyone stopped KBS instead. So yeah, extreme durability and extreme rust abating properties. One of the byproducts of that is that being moisture cured and very hard, uh, you don't want to get this on you anywhere during the process because any paint that sets on you is not coming off you. So you really want to make sure you've got your PPE on in terms of gloves and glasses or even a face shield. Uh, I did have a funny story from the guy I bought this off. Uh, he sold it to a guy that was going to spray paint because you can thin this down and spray it. Uh, the underside of his car uh, and came back with a uh, polka dot face uh, with black marks asking what thinners he could use to get it off. And the answer was, you're gonna look like that for a very long time. So take the precautions. Now, the other complication here is that this degreaser here is a water-based degreaser. And this is a, um, I guess, one of the rust converters that moves rust into phosphorus. But I'm not sure if it's different somehow to other ones. But what I have heard is, if you use normal wax and grease remover, and then you use a normal rust converter, you can compromise the ability for the rust seal to adhere. That's why I've stayed all within the same system. Now I know when we're talking about products like this, a lot of people would suggest that Raptor Liner is the way to go because it's pretty big on the scene at the moment and it has very heavy advertising. I don't have any problem with Raptor Liner itself, but for the interior, it's gonna make it really difficult to stick on any like bitumen underlayer or anything that I want for sound deadening or to control temperature. So that's gonna have trouble sticking to the Raptor Liner surface because it's not smooth. The second thing is that Raptor Liner also can't adhere to bare metal. So the way that this stops rust is that you, for rust to form, you've gotta have iron and then you've gotta have oxygen to create iron oxide rust. This sticks to the metal with such a degree that it doesn't let any air in. It has a 0% uh, porosity factor uh, so it doesn't let any moisture in or any air in, therefore no rust until you compromise this layer by scratching it or something like that. But again, very durable, so hard to scratch anyway. Now Raptor Liner can't adhere to bare metal. It has to have primer underneath it. So realistically, when you're talking about the strength at which it attaches to the body of the car, it's really only as strong as the layer of primer that it's attached to. So while the outer shell of Raptor Liner may be really hard to scratch, uh, it's really only bonded the same as any normal paint. So yeah, I have actually considered using Raptor Liner under the car, but even in that case, what I would probably do is put some rust seal as the first primer layer to make sure that if the Raptor Liner ever chips off or flakes away because it's hit by a rock or just degrades over time, that we'll still have a really good quality substrate for it to bond to and protect that surface. That said, with a product like this, for the underside, Raptor line is probably a little bit of overkill as well and I can probably get away with a cheaper alternative. I'm not sure which way I'm going to go on Violet Crumbles, but obviously you'll know when I do. So the correct process for this is to first degrease all the surfaces with AquaClean. This can be distilled with water and uh, ideally the hotter the water the better. I'm interested to see how that's going to go. I don't really like the idea of putting water based anything onto bare metal, but that's the process, so we'll follow the process. The second one is the rust blast. Now. The instructions for this are pretty clear, and that is to make sure that any loose rust is gone, which we've already done. And then mainly for me, this is around the pitted areas that still have some discoloration. They're not perfectly clean sheet metal. Um, to liberally wet them down and keep them wet. So the idea is you keep coating on this and keep it wet and wet and wet. And then again, you wash this off using water. So I'm gonna make sure this gets into all of the nooks and crannies and all of those pitted surfaces. And then I'm gonna dry it as best I can. And then we'll get onto the rust seal. Now it's important to note between these two steps, you don't have to perfectly remove all rust. 
The idea of the rust blast is not to get it back to a silver metal. It's just to treat that rust as best as we can. And then the rust seal itself will go over the top and seal that surface in. So if there's a little bit of rust there, you've got 0% porosity, no water, no air getting in, and therefore no progression of that rust. And finally on the rust seal, I have actually got a satin black. Uh, I'm not super keen on the gloss black look of Pore 15 and of the standard uh, rust seal. So I actually chose for satin black in the uh, interior because I'm not gonna be putting an interior in that for a while, so you're gonna see it. And uh, I'm just hoping that satin black looks a little bit more OEM. So yeah, that's the system we're using. Let's take a look at the car now and see where we're at. Okay, so first up with the degreaser, I'm using 50 degree water and I'm also using a Scotch-Brite pad because I figured if I'm gonna be cleaning the top layer, I might as well key anything that I've missed with the wire wheels and the stripper discs. This didn't feel like a particularly special degreaser when I was using it, but I did notice that after I was done, there was none of that kerosene-like residue that you can get with some other non-water-based degreasers. Then we had that next step, which was to flush the areas with clean water to get rid of any remaining degreaser. For this one, I thought if I had the interior out, I might as well just send it with the garden hose. There was a lot of water, which nearly had me regretting removing those rusty old bung holes, as the center sections are now full of dirty water, but I busted out the wet and dry vac and I took care of the problem in short order. This did come back to bite me in the ass later though, because I forgot that I no longer had a foam filter in the vac and instead ran water straight through my paper filter and now it's completely flogged out. Once the majority of the water was gone, I toweled the whole thing off as best as I could and then I thought I'd get really smart and use my blower vac to blow out all the joints. This was actually a complete bonehead manoeuvre and all it did was really pick up any dust that was on the surfaces that I hadn't yet cleaned and distributed it all around the cabin, which meant I had to give it another going over with a clean microfiber towel. Then here we have the Rust Blast, which is a beautiful Smurf Piss Blue. I just used a paintbrush to spread this over all of the sheet metal and I paid some special attention to areas like this that were particularly pitted and I pushed as much as I could into any joint areas. I kept all the surfaces wet with rust blast for about an hour and then I had to wash it off again and this time I just used a two cloth technique wet and dry as I went through to try and minimize the flash rusting. And then this time I actually got smart and I used my heat gun to blow out all the remaining seams and dry everything up completely. After that I just left the whole thing to dry for a couple more hours just to be sure. The rust blast seemed pretty good, not only does it obviously neutralize the rust, but it also seemed to etch the surface a bit. So while there's still a bit of flash rust around the place and a really cool hologram effect on the coloring, it also felt like there was a really good surface that the rust sealer could bond to. For the sealer itself, first thing to make sure of is that you have a plastic sandwich bag to put between the lid and the can once you've opened it. Then you just need to stir it really well. This is about five minutes worth and you have to stir, not shake it. As shaking will put air all through the paint and it'll ruin the finish. Don't paint from the can either because it'll cure in the time that you're doing the job. So decant it into something disposable, pop the plastic bag between the can and the lid and seal it all up tight. Then it's onto the painting. There's no need for commentary here. So just enjoy three minutes of pure unadulterated Zen progress.
All right, we're done. The gloss level is still off the charts. It's still drying, so I'm hoping that sheen will come down in a few hours. I will uh, hopefully come back to that in this episode and show you the finished product in a more matte finish, or satin finish rather. Uh, other than that, there's a few runs, there's a little bit of sand, um, but what I'll do is, it'll probably be easier to see once it is matted off. So let's go have a quick review. I also wanna talk about that welding mask as well, because I said I was gonna do that. So yeah, let's go to the workbench. Okay, so the welding helmet. Now, if you've got a welding helmet at home and you're very happy with it, you don't need to skip ahead in this bit. Now's the perfect time for you to like, subscribe, and make sure you hit that notification bell. And if you do have a helmet at home that you're really happy with, why don't you just put a comment in below and let me know what it is and what you like about it. Uh, but in terms of the Lincoln 3350, man, I gotta say, this was night and day in comparison to that old helmet. It really surprised me at how much of a difference just being able to see more would make when I was trying to weld. Not only could I get the context and see where I was, so it was easy to find where I needed to start a weld, but also while I was welding, the clarity of this thing's amazing. So firstly, when you don't have an arc and the lens is open, you can see pretty much everything. It's like having a very slightly tinted set of sunglasses on, but really nothing you can't just look straight past. And then as soon as you fire up an arc, straight away blacks out and uh, even at that point though you can really see all of the detail and it comes through in a really natural color um, i'm used to welding helmets giving a really deep green tinge to everything and making everything dark so you really got to squint and look hard for the detail this was kind of like i was looking at exactly what i was welding without a helmet on it was just less intense the next thing was the grinding button and that was a double-edged sword so firstly like i said you can see through this lens exceptionally well so not having to take it off and just being able to hit that button and then go ahead and grind surfaces was really handy the only problem that i found with it and i'm sure i will get better at this is the light that tells you when you're in grind mode is right down the bottom of the helmet here and it's quite low in your eye line you sort of have to look down if you want to actually see it and so what i found was I would hit the grind button, grind a whole bunch of stuff, get a little bit distracted, and then go to strike up that first arc and bang. No protection whatsoever from the lens. Uh, well, actually, you do get some protection to be fair. I think it's something like a equivalent of a 3.5 uh, shading on the lens, but you know, when you're doing a MIG, I want to be up near 11, so. 11, look, right across the board. Oh. 11, oh, 11, and most of 11. This. And so really not where you want to be, and I did get a couple of big flashes. Um, I'm sure I will get used to that, but Lincoln really should have just put the light further up on the panel and it would have been quite easy. It probably would have been a bit distracting while you were grinding, but better to be a little bit distracted while you're grinding than have flash blindness. A couple of other things, it was really easy to adjust this helmet in terms of not just the, uh, the fit around my head and things like that, but also the uh, distance from my face. Now you'll see in the videos that I was wearing a disposable paper filter, that's a P99 or a whatever it is, a P2 uh, mask over here, uh, which is suitable for grinding and welding. Um, but I do want to at some point start wearing a respirator on it. It's just the respirator that I've got at the moment is a little bit too bulky to be comfortable. So I'm looking for a different respirator. Again, if you've got a good one for welding, put a comment below and uh, lead me in the right direction. And I talked about this before being a little bit pinchy in here. It remains pinchy. Uh, I did learn a valuable lesson and that was to at all times make sure that I have my head covering on. But in the end, I think that turned out to be a pretty good thing because it forces me to put the headgear on. Uh, and then when I'm welding, I can feel, you know, things hitting it, sparks and things like that. So I'm actually quite thankful that I'm wearing it. But yeah, overall, I am really happy with that helmet. I think it's money well spent and I'm going to uh, appreciate that more and more over time. Yeah, really happy I paid the investment on that one. Now, in terms of the rust seal. So let's go through it again, just quickly. So degreaser, cleaner, the rust blast, and then the rust seal. Now, overall, it was a pretty intensive process. Uh, you know, I had to scrub everything and then you have to hose it out, basically. They don't want you to have uh, residue of that, which is why I just got the hose in there. Uh, and then you've got to do the rust blast and the rust blast, you then got to water down uh, so that you neutralize the acids in it and then you can throw the rust seal on. So yeah, pretty intensive process. It's not one that I'd recommend for everyone. I mean, the reason I'm doing it on Violet Crumbles is because it's had so much water egress into that interior from both the front windscreen area and the boot and the rear windscreen area. So 
all three of those things have just been forcing water into that uh, cockpit for a while and I wanted to make sure that it was just really well protected moving forward. In terms of the rust seal itself, uh, I was really, really impressed with this. It's kind of like painting with maple syrup. Now, this is a litre tin and I only used half of it. So I did the entire interior. I only did one coat, but I did quite a thick coat with 500 mil. So there's a couple of things there. You would have seen while I was prepping that, I had to dig out all of the old seam sealer and stuff like that. So at some point I have to go back and re-seam sealer that whole interior. And then I might actually put a second coat of this over the top to seal them all in. You can't put the seam sealer underneath the first coat of this rust seal. Otherwise, what you're doing is using the seam sealer as a rust proofer and it doesn't work. Seam sealer is only there to stop water ingress through a seam between two pieces of metal. It's not there to protect the pieces of metal themselves. You're gonna encapsulate that seam sealer from the top, but you're not really doing anything to protect the metal underneath. So I'm pretty sure you can put this over the top of seam sealer for the second coat. So that might be what I do. Or if my seam sealer looks nice enough, I might just leave it. So we'll see how well it holds up. And uh, I may not do a second coat. I may end up just using this to do the boot uh, and maybe the chassis rails, which I want to do black as well. So in terms of a product, really easy to paint on. Uh, you saw me just absolutely slathering it on. Now there is some runs and some other bits. I probably put it on a bit too thick, but Considering I'm not having to spray it, I was really happy. It let me get into all the nooks and crannies and really um, you would have seen me dabbing the brush in seams and things like that to push as much of the rust seal as I could through. Ideally, I'm hoping when I get under the car, I'll see little droplets of rust seal that have come through some of those seams to show me that it's wicked all the way through and protected them really well. In terms of the smell and things like that, it's not too bad. The one thing that I did get bitten with though, and I warned, uh, I warned you guys early on and then I completely disregarded my own advice uh, was I did not wear enough PPE. Well, in fact, um, I wore gloves and that was pretty much it. So it's very, very thick. So I wasn't really worried about um, splashback from brushing. Uh, but if you're going to go crazy and, and really go heavy, I would recommend a face shield. But what I did do was try to paint the inside of the driver's side sill lent my arm on it and yeah, got, got. So that's not coming off anytime soon. Uh, and I also got a drip on my toe, uh, which is something that I was being very careful, but actually went through one of the grommet holes and dripped on it. So such is life, the toe I can deal with. This will probably be a little bit more embarrassing and work. It really doesn't want to come off. Uh, I have used thinners on that water. I've scrubbed it. Uh, no, ha no chance of it going anywhere. But overall, super happy with it and time will tell how much it holds up. Oh, and the final thing is the satin black. So as I said before, this is normally gloss black. You have to special order it from all the shops that I've seen in Perth anyway, uh, in satin black. Uh, they also do a gray and I've got some of the gray to test out in the wheel arches, but the difference between gloss and satin is astronomical. So it's actually about three or four hours later from when I finished painting. I've had time to clean up and get some dinner into me and it is done and it looks a million bucks. So this is what it looked like when I just finished painting and it was highly glossy. And this is what it looks like now. Like I said, so glad I made the call on satin. Now there is a few runs in it and also there's a lot of sand in it. Now I vacuumed this and brushed it out and did a whole bunch of different things. And then I stupidly grabbed the uh, axial blower and uh, blew air around it with shot sand everywhere. And then also I sucked up those two big puddles of water with my wet and dry vac and uh, ended up forgetting that I had the wrong filter in it, wet the filter and couldn't vacuum it out again. So uh, I did my best to blow it out, but then I think the mistake that I made was trying to dab the brush into too many of the holes uh, behind support panels and things like that. So in doing that, what I did was move all the sand and stuff that was in them out on the brush and then I painted it onto the surface. It's not a big deal. Um, I don't think it's gonna compromise the layer at all, but it doesn't look as neat as it could. Uh, I think that if you honestly, if you got a gun and you spray this stuff on a really clean surface, it might look pretty amazing. Uh, if it was UV rated, I would consider actually doing a car in it and having a beautiful satin black car that really held up to a bit of punishment. But I think it will go chalky and horrible in the sun, so I'm not gonna waste any time doing that. But yeah, looks a million bucks and I'm super stoked with it. And more to the point, I'm even more happier that we can finally start moving on with some other bits of the project. Now, next week, we've got a video on the Supra. I'm gonna 
vinyl wrap the roof and get it ready for Toyota's in the park. And then we'll have some footage from Toyota's in the park. So if you want to see some first gen Celicas and some other cool cars, uh, stay tuned for that one. And after that episode, then we're going to introduce some of the other Toyotas that I have in my fleet. And we're going to start a special quick project or what I hope will be a quick project. But that'll be another one for all the Toyota enthusiasts watching. And if you're new to the channel, I'd recommend watching the full Violet Crumble series here. And I've also got some Mark V Super content down here. Other than that, I just want to say thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on The Build Room. Bye for now.